Good afternoon. Today I'm talking about the goal of zero, specifically approaching zero energy, zero waste, and zero water. But really, what are these things? Net zero energy is when we make our buildings so efficient that we can then offset that energy demand with renewable energy sources. We can do the same thing with water. We can capture water on our site, use it to flush our toilets, use it for irrigation, and if we purify it, we can drink that water also. And with waste, all the waste that we bring into our site can either be composted, recycled, or reused. We can eliminate the waste stream that's going into the landfills. This is a graphic representation of our carbon footprint. The brown heel is the United States, the yellow ball of the foot is China, and what's interesting is those two toes up on the upper right-hand portion is Africa. Africa is one of our largest continents, but it has some of the smallest contribution to our carbon footprint. So our goal of zero is to make this go down to a baby footprint, the goal to approach no footprint on our planet. The power is yours, coming from Captain Planet being an 80s baby, what did Captain Planet compose of? Earth, wind, fire, water, heart. But really, what are these things? Earth is our materials and our resources. It's our built environment. Air is our emissions. It's our indoor and out outdoor air quality. Electricity is the new fire. It fuels our society. Water is such a precious resource that we can't substitute that for anything else. Water is water. And heart is the passion by which we bring all of these things together. And by bringing things together and taking that forward, one of the best ways we can do that is through education. So we can utilize our schools as a teaching tool. We can utilize that built environment to advance ourselves forward. How many people went to a school that looked like this? It was four walls, desks, and a chalkboard with a teacher, right? And during the, the summer months, when it started to get warmer, they turned out the lights, they closed the blinds, and they said, deal with it, right? How many people dealt with hot classrooms? This was the 20th century school. This was the entire history of our learning environment. But today, we have a lot of technology. And so when we're thinking about planning our schools, this is the planning of Powell Elementary School. You can see the, the gray is the streets that define this actual site. The green is this relationship that we have as a connection to the outdoors. You can see this original building was built in the 1920s. They did an addition in 1959, and then we just did another addition in the last two years. What's interesting about this, this is the back side of Powell Elementary School, is on the right side of this image you see a cupola. And what that is is a glass atrium at the top of the building. You used to see these on a lot of schoolhouses back in the day. The glass acts as a greenhouse. And what happens in a greenhouse? It gets hot. Hot air rises. So what that did was create a vacuum in our classrooms. So when you open the windows, it brings that cool air in from the outdoors. Usually there used to be trees planted around so the exterior was shaded. We've replicated that here in the new addition with solar chimneys that operate on that same principle. To that point, in the classrooms, we now have buttons, green, yellow, and red. If it's green, the students can go and open the windows, connecting them to that built environment. Putting in passive ventilation strategies like this can reduce energy consumption up to 40% in, the in these buildings. Having an east-west orientation of these buildings will reduce our energy consumption by an additional 10%. Putting the shade walls, like the device you see there on the back, will shade the facade, similar to trees would shade a facade, which will reduce your energy consumption by another 5%. So what that does is it allows us to approach that goal of zero energy through passive design strategies that aren't costing us that much money. The shade wall will have a 10-year return on investment and will save an average of $12,000 a year. So there's a financial element to moving all of these steps forward. And this is a cross-section of the school. So what we've done here is actually quantified sustainability in this built environment. We're looking at the materials and the resources of the building envelope. 
We're making sure that we have a well-insulated building with a tight building envelope. We, we connect that to the students and what they're learning in the classroom. We can utilize the daylight that's coming into our spaces, and if we utilize the daylight effectively, we can reduce the number of artificial light or lights in the classroom by 30 to 50%, the number of fixtures. Which is great because then you have an, uh, the right amount of quality of light because we're over lighting our buildings. So by effective design, we can not only teach students today what we are currently doing in their spaces, but how they can advance this knowledge forward. Because students in a middle school or high school are gonna be working in 10 to 15 years. It's not a far leap before we move that forward. So we continue that forward, we have a better acoustical structure in our buildings. We put in low flow work fixtures where we can reduce the water consumption by 50%. That's augmented by capturing the rainwater on the roof and using that to flush the toilets. All of this helps us approach that goal of zero water. And then in the cafeteria, we put in composting bins. We educate on how to compost, what to compost, how to recycle, and then we can reduce that entire waste stream and recycle or compost everything that's in that school environment. This school has a connection to the outside with a community garden, so you can teach students how to grow food, how to eat nutritious food, and how to compost food, completing that life cycle using the school environment. Dunbar High School is the highest, newly, highest lead rated newly constructed school in the world. And it's really interesting, it was also the home of the first power purchase agreement. So we had a third party entity coming in to put solar panels on the roof. This is where we can develop those relationships in public buildings to the private industry. This is a really great 21st century school, but what's interesting is it's kind of like running and operating a school, you, you build the school, you commission it, you make sure everything's working, but that's like going to the gym for a week. So what we need to do is to keep that evolution going. So what we've done here, this is actually a graphic representation from January to January, from midnight to midnight. So the area that you see on the left side is night, the unoccupied use of the building. And so where you see this first arrow on the left, we had a meeting with the facilities, the school administration, the architects, the engineers, the commissioning agent, the people who pay the utility bills, because they're all different entities. This is the first time we had six different groups come to the table and have a conversation. From a two-hour meeting, we reduced summer consumption by 40%, by streamlining that schedule, by tweaking some of the temperature set points, but making sure everybody was accommodated when they needed to use that space. The following fall operated 20% more efficiently than the first fall of operations. That was a $50,000 a year savings in one of the highest lead rated buildings in the world. What's interesting about this is we spend $6 billion a year in the United States on utility bills in schools alone. By taking this type of exercise and optimizing the performance, we could save $2 billion annually of taxpayers' money as we move forward. This has also led to new companies and new innovations. This is RISE, Resilient, Innovative, Sustainable, Efficient School. It also doubles over as an office space and emergency response space. What we're doing here is cap using a shipping container. So we're using the dredges of society and repurposing that into a building that is zero energy. So it is efficient enough and incorporates all this new technology, the technology we have today to be a zero energy building. We capture the rainwater and purify that so we can provide fresh drinking water. And then we have that connection with the outdoors so we can recycle or compost and demand of the materials that are coming in that they are recyclable or compostable. This is especially relevant because it makes a lot of financial sense for all of us. It reduces our environmental impact and we see this call to action the agreement in Paris last year, the entire world came together and said, we need to make a difference. This is all technology that we have today. This isn't something that we're planning about doing or talking about doing. All of these things that we have discussed are things that we are doing, and it's scalable. 
you actually see that here in the solar decathlon, where you have engineering students in college from all across the country come together to participate in the Department of Energy's program every two years. What they're doing here is they're taking materials and resources that we have in our environment, making zero energy buildings. They're approaching zero water. They're playing with all the different technologies that we currently have to show us what we can do with our current buildings and what we can do with our new residential buildings. This scales up into office buildings. This is a 350,000 square foot office space in Sacramento, California. This is the municipal utility building. This is a net zero building. It exists today, it's happening, and, and the number of net zero buildings is growing. Every building that we continue to build as we move shore, forward should be a net zero building. This scales up into our cities. It's interesting that we now have a million people globally moving into cities every week. That statistic is projected to continue until the end of the century. What we currently have as our infrastructure is not sustainable. But if we approach zero energy and have cities like this, utilizing all the technologies that we talked about, retrofitting our current existing buildings and updating the models as we move forward with passive technologies, augmenting that with renewable intermittent energy sources, and we continue to advance those technologies forward, creating jobs, creating industry, educating our students about how we can progress forward, we can capture and reuse the rainwater that's falling into our cities and not dumping all those pollutants out into the environment, but capture that water and reutilize it in a way where we have a zero water impact so we can maintain those aquifers. And if we go and work towards that zero waste civilization, we will be able to advance forward and recycle and compost all of the goods that are coming in and coming out of our cities. This will allow us to achieve a resilient and sustainable world. Thank you. <laughs>